Okay, without further ado, a beautiful song for us to reflect on. And now our devotion for this evening is brought to us by none other than our recently elected Youth Ministries Director from the British Union Conference, Pastor Kevin Johns. Pastor Johns, over to you. Thank you very much, Sister Judy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just make sure you can all hear me, is that okay? Yes, good, wonderful, wonderful. I just want to share some thoughts with you this evening. And I'm coming from the book from Second Kings, and it says this Second Kings chapter five, verses two and three. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Now the whole of Naaman's fascinating story revolves around the nameless captive little maid who belonged to Israel. I don't know about you, but have you ever wondered why this little maid has remained nameless? In fact, we read of other maids in the Bible, but this particular maid, no name is given. All we have is some 26 words which cover all we know of this Jewish female slave, which whose record consists of only one remark, which is often sufficient to describe a character as it does in the story of this nameless heroine. Now I had to look into this. Why no name? So you've got to do some research into this. But from this, I have gathered four things. Four things which I want to share with you this evening. Number one, she was a believer. Her home from which she was forcibly taken was a godly Hebrew home where God was honored. His servant, Elijah, was revered. Young though this maid was, she feared the Lord and her incorrigible faith was a flaming light, the spirit of every that, that shined in everyone that she met. And in fact, this light that she had, it really permeates through the drama and impact the lives of others. Naaman and his wife, the Syrian king, the servants who quickened Naaman's footsteps and the prophet Elijah himself all felt the impact of a little maid who was holy the Lord and believed implicitly in his power. Brought to live among idolaters, she clung to her own faith in living God and sought to share her knowledge of him with others. Now hers was a strong faith. It was a contagious faith, enabling her to live without any feeling of homesickness in an alien land and without having any resentment against her captors. Her love for God inspired her to love her masters and to win her, effect, her way into their affections and confidence. She never hid her light under a bushel and although she was only a maid, this, this, this godly girl did not feel she was too unimportant to influence others. Number two, she was a slave. Close your eyes for a moment, please. Just close your eyes for a moment. I want you to think of the tears and the tragedy wrapped in the phrase, brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. Now we now have no idea how old she was. All we have is a young girl brought back captive from the land of Israel. That's verse two of our text. And she was nothing but a slave. Uh, this, this Hebrew girl was accounted amongst the spoils of war. During one of the Syrian incursions or flying raids, she was stolen and taken across the border. Perhaps, just perhaps, the raid occurred at night and she was aroused by the groans of those who were being slaughtered. And among them, those, those that she heard her own father, her own father's voice. And in the midst of all the confusion, all at once she felt the grasp 
of a cruel raider and was wrenched from all that was dear to her heart. That tragic night, she lost all that made life precious, all her dear loved ones, and even liberty itself, and was taken to the slave market of Damascus where Naaman secured her as a servant for his wife. Can you imagine how bewildered and how frightened and how tearful this lone and sorrowful figure must have been when Naaman secured her? How this dear girl dragged away by the Syrians must have turned her heart heavenward for the protecting care of God who had promised to be as a covert from the tempest. She must have been totally distraught. Number three, she was a maid. Now, among the girls taken as slaves, some were used to labor in the fields and stables of their captors. Others had a higher rank in the social life of Naaman's day and became house servants and were given as maids in waiting to the mistress of her home. It was in this capacity that the Jewish girl whom Naaman had appropriated served his wife. Now, while such a lowly station was inferior to the position she probably occupied at home before it was plundered by the Syrians, she yet became attached to her master, whom she admired as a mighty man of valor, and to her mistress, to whom she was most loyal and whose confidence she held. While Naaman's wife was not a follower of Jehovah God, she must have respected the religious faith of her maid, who doubtlessly expressed it on more than one occasion, and who certainly lived it in her captured home. Even in her experience, she must have demonstrated her relationship with the God whom she loved and served. For as we can gather from this story, and as we read between the lines, somehow, somehow, while the Syrian lady was very kind to this lonely slave and treated her more like a confidant than just a servant. The possibilities and environment of the maid were limited, but she had a strong faith and a loving heart. And although humble, she was true to her God in a moment of need. Thus, I believe she is remembered throughout successive generations for what she did. Now her fascinating story, brief though it is, teaches us the far reaching influence of the humblest and most insignificant, significant, insignificant God's service. You may not regard the position you have as very high. In fact, you may regard, not regard it as very much at all, but God has put you in place for a very special purpose. Godly maids and nurses with an appropriate sense of their, of their responsibilities wield a tremendous influence over their fellow servants, over children and parents in a home. You may not be the company director, or you may have a line manager watching over you, always reminding you of this and that, but always remember you have opportunities of service for the Lord that are not restricted or may not be as restricted as you might think. There is always an opportunity to serve when you're following God. Number four, she was a herald. As she dutifully waited upon Naaman's wife, this, this captive maid came to know about the great soldier's disease and how concerned her mistress was over his condition. Perhaps, just perhaps one day, while the maid was waiting on her, she expressed the feeling, if only something could be done for my husband's leprosy, how re relieved I would be. I, I wish some means of curing him could be found. The maid might have noticed how the incurable disease was preying on the mind and body of her kind master. The shadow over the household gave the maid her opportunity and having learned to sing the song of the Lord in a strange land, she was ready to tell her, her distressed mistress that her husband could be cured. 
Listen to the cry that forced itself from the heart of this young Hebrew herald. If only, if only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Now that is a power-packed sentence. Those few words, they are so loaded. You see, it tells us so much about this young lady. Now she had every confidence that Nahum would be healed. Why could you have such confidence? Because we can gather from all of this that she was connected to God. She had a relationship with God, even in her youthful young age. Even though she was brought as a slave, ripped from her home, she had not given up on God. Because of her concern, Naaman's wife was willing to welcome any sympathy and snatch at any hint of relief for her husband. And I believe she could only do this because this young lady had captured her heart. In this young lady, she had seen some, some, form, some form of integrity, something different, that something that she had grown to love and trust. And so even though she was just a child, those words sounded like wonderful music to her ears. She could see the pity and yet faith in the face of her maid, uh, maid and it didn't escape her eyes. And she immediately trusted her and told the leprous man of the good news her maid had said, so positively, so positively declared, for it was good news. And she's believing this from this little girl who's just a slave. Naaman too believed what the captive maid had said. This is the impact she had had on their lives. Naaman didn't doubt her. He took her word to his ruler, the king, who impressed, was also impressed by the testimony of this little girl, and so sent him as an ambassador to Israel, asking the king of Israel for Elijah to heal him. Now, Elijah might, Elijah might be allowed to cure his brilliant servant. Took a lot of faith in them to believe this young girl. It just goes to show the kind of person she was and the relationship that she had. It gave them all this trust. This is the influence a child had. I can see Naaman now. He arriving at the king's palace with their command, with a with their introduction from his king. And the king said, man, this is something wrong going on here. How, how can he expect me to do this? And Elijah hears, hears of it and speaks up about it. And so sent, and so the king sends him to Elijah. Now Naaman was, came with all his pomp and ceremony, expected some grand welcome and so forth. But what he got dented his pride. His pride received a serious blow when he was met by Gehazi, Elijah's servant. Not even Elijah himself. He was met by a servant. And the servant just conveyed a message to Nahum. The message that all what he must do was go and bathe himself seven times in, some muddy, in the muddy water of Jordan if he wanted to be cured. Now, at, at first, Nahum was enraged and felt humiliated. But... With a temper somewhat cooled by his servants, and remembering, remembering the maid's convincing testimony as to Elisha's power as a miracle worker, Naaman carried out the prophetic instructions and came out of the river after the seventh bathing, completely healed of his leprosy. He went home to Syria, not only with a body thoroughly healed, but also with a cleansed soul. No longer a worshipper of our idols, if you please. He became an avowed worshipper of the God of heaven. How that little maid must have felt rewarded for her loyalty to God, for her part in the entire episode. Now, Wordsworth wrote of her as one in whom persuasion and belief had ripened into faith and faith became a passionate intent. Just imagine for a moment, if she had not been true to God, if she had, if she had held a grudge 
against the Syrians for ripping her out of her home and dragging her to this place and making her into a slave and living this, this life of servitude. Just imagine if she had held that up in her heart. Just imagine if, if she had never expressed her faith at the time her mistress expressed her anxiety over her husband's leprosy. The narrative before us would have never have been written and we would have never and we would have missed one of the finest bits of religious inspiration in the scriptures uh, this this captive member this captive maid was the first pathfinder the first guide because in the first place she was a guide to naaman a guide to him to whose waters of blessing in which alone he could find healing nobody else could have gone to the jordan and dipped seven times and be healed only Naaman. And in the second place, she evidently, evidently belonged in spirit to young people who believe in doing a kind action every day. Those are pathfinders. I have no doubt whatsoever that the maid's mistress came to share her husband's newly found faith in God and their home became a thoroughly transformed place. Because of her acceptance of her lowly lot and her simple faith and sweet intercession, that despised captive, too obscure to be called by any name, will be held in everlasting remembrance. As a daughter of Abraham, she was true to God in an idolatrous family. Even though there is no further word about the maid after her faithful testimony, I believe that Naaman did not forget his young benefactress. I wonder how the restored mighty man of valor treated the captive maid after his return. Did he reward her for all she had meant to him with her freedom, sending her home to surviving relatives with riches and gifts to establish herself among her own? But whatever recompense Nahum gave his wife's wonderful maid, we know that it was an expression of his grateful heart and noble character. So wherever you are today, God has called you for a purpose. He placed you where you are to teach out, to reach out to those who are living without Jesus in their lives. So don't be afraid. Trust that he is working behind the scenes on your behalf, even in the unseemingly hopeless situation you're facing yourself right now. Jesus, yes, is in control. Please read Isaiah 43, verse 2. Jesus also invites you to come as you are. Every time you feel weary, discouraged, and troubled, Jesus says, come. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, verse 28. You see, he promises relief, rest, ref ref refreshment, and restoration for weary souls. What are you waiting for? Just come to him, and he will restore you. We see in we see a forgiving heart in this little maid. She bore no grudge against the people who caused her so much pain. And that is truly admirable. No grudge. Regardless of how we have been hurt by others, we must forgive them. Yes, you can forgive that person who hurt you. You really can. Don't think you can't. If you put your trust in God, you truly can. And bitterness. I said no bitterness in this young lady for the way she was treated. Likewise, bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness are typical responses to injustice. But we need not go there. This young lady portrayed none of that. She had forgiven her captors a long time ago. And as a result of that, she was portraying a godly character. My friends, God wants you to move on toward the future he has planned for you. It's a future filled with hope and new beginnings. Pour out your heart to God. Ask for the courage to break free of whatever it is that is binding you to the past. Know that God understands and feels the pain of your heart. Trust him to bring something good out of your pain. Ask him to give you new hope and restore your life's purpose. Invite God to help you understand his purpose for your life and give you a new vision for the new beginnings he has in store for you, Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. Despite 
her living in an adulterous nation, the little maid maintained her faith in Jehovah, her God. We could understand if she let go of her faith. In fact, we wouldn't criticize her too much because she was just a little girl. And to bear all of that at her tender age, we would have a little compassion for her. But she didn't let go. She remained faithful and true to the God of heaven. My question to you this evening, is trouble shaking your faith in God? Is the situation getting on top of you that you just can't handle it anymore? Well, let me tell you this. Trust God today. Have faith in God's ultimate plan for you. Regardless of what today looks like, you are never forgotten by him. Even when you can't fully see the path ahead, trust that he has a unique plan for your life. So wherever God has placed you, serve. Where has God placed you? How can you be a light, bright light there? Who needs to hear about Jesus in your neighborhood? Jesus told his followers in Matthew 5 verse 14, you are the light of the world. If others are going to hear about the Lord Jesus, they are going to hear it from you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 verse 16. If the little maid had said nothing of the prophet Elisha, Naaman would have died a leper. Today, there's a prophet greater than Elisha. You know him. His name is Jesus. Are you witnessing Jesus to others? If you're not, then what are you waiting for? Start right now. May God bless you this evening as we continue with our symposium. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we pause for a moment, we want to give you thanks for who you are. And Lord, for reminding us that although we may seem insignificant, although we may seem of no value, you have already placed a value upon each and every one of us, and you have a work for us to do. So Lord, be with us. Take us, mold us, and use us. So as leaders of young people, we can be effective in make, helping them to draw closer into relationship with you. We will struggle from time to time we we'll become discouraged from time to time. But dear God, please hold us up, lift us up so we can do mighty works for you and in touching the lives of others is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.